Yeah. All right. Well, then it's uh, thank you all for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our next three speakers. Um, today we have three brave souls who are willing to go through the uh, photosynthesis measurements with the beta units, which means all kinds of software bugs and all kinds of measurable problems. They can tell you about those later. Um, so our first speaker is Andrew Wiersma, who is a PhD student in plant, soil, molecular science. Yep. And uh, the plant breeding and genetics uh, program as well. So. Yeah, so I really uh, actually chose the, this picture on my title page um, because it really represents, as a, as a wheat as a wheat breeder in training, what we're really after here in its yield. Um, this is my colleague Kyle McCarthy driving the combine, and um, you know that combine is actually measuring grain yield, but you know it's it's important I think for this discussion to also remember you know that grain yield isn't uh, in isolation. You can also see these piles of uh, wheat straw that's been cut from an individual plot, so it really represents that. The biomass. So I think what I'm trying to revolve a lot of this talk around is this intersection of you know, how is uh, wheat photosynthesis related to biomass, which is also related to yield, and you know where is the intersection, and um, how can we tease those relationships apart to uh, better select higher yielding varieties of wheat. So the experimental design, so I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'll go back real quickly. Um, I'm a PhD student, but I was working on this project with Casey Regan, who's, who was an undergraduate um, in our lab at the time, and he went on to start a master's degree at North Carolina State uh, in a soybean greening program. So the experimental design uh, that I worked out with this undergrad is um, we really wanted to see you know, first of all, what the device could do, and um, we're interested in differences between locations, we're interested in differences between genotypes, we're interested in differences in management. So it sounds like a lot, but I think we came up with a, a decent plan to try to start to tease apart these uh, uh, different factors. So what we did was we chose three environments, um, which were actually just two locations. One was near campus at the Mason Breeding Farm, and the other was at Richville, which is in a more productive region of, uh, of Michigan for, for wheat production. The Thumb is generally considered the highest yielding counties for wheat in Michigan. And uh, so we really wanted you know, an optimal environment versus you know, mediocre to moderate environment for wheat production. So we, the reason I call it three environments is because um, at Mason, we also added a, the exact same trial was grown under conventional management, which uh, didn't have as much fertilizer and uh, did not have the addition of foliar uh, fungicide supply. So three environments, um, in each environment, we had complete blocks, three complete blocks, and we measured each plot four times, two in the morning, two in the evening, or in the afternoon, uh, to try to compensate for any daytime variation. And then we also measured these plants at four growth stages. They included Fix 9, uh, 10.5, 11.1, and 11.2. And we measured a uh, in every case, we measured the most apically dominant leaf. At the earliest stage, though, that happened to be the fix, uh, or flag leaf minus one leaf that we measured. And uh, in total, we measured 30 genotypes. These were all soft white and red winter wheat um, that are well adapted for the Michigan environment. So when you do the math, that comes out to a total of 4,320 measurements, of which um, we got useful data from a majority. Um, after all the, you know, malfunctions and you know a couple uh, data points that we threw out due to the infamous bad data, uh, however it's measured, um, we actually got rid of a little over 10% of the data points. Which I, I think, given that this is a beta. 
um, device that's perfectly acceptable, and we had ample, you know, data to represent um, all of our genotypes and all of our under all of our environments um, and replications. So let's just dive right in. Um, first, I just want to talk about the yield at these under these three different environments. So on the x-axis, you can see we have the Mason location in blue, the Richville location in red. Mason is split into conventional versus high management. So in the most productive region of Michigan, we have both high test weight and high yield. Um, and then under high management at Mason, uh, it's a little bit lower yield, um, but that's also superior to the conventionally managed plots. I'll also point out that at Richville, we had tighter variance compared to Mason. A lot of this is due to how wet the summer was last year, and we had some standing water in a few sections of the field, which led to greater variance in uh, yield in those, in those plots at the Mason location. Question? Yes? What were the size of the plots, and how many plots did you take for your yield data? Um, so at each location, uh, the, a given genotype was replicated three times, for three plots. Uh, the plot size was uh, four row by 20 foot, so that's, uh, yeah, roughly, let's see, five, five by 20, roughly, feet. Um, Thank you. And uh, four measurements were taken in each plot at each growth stage. So just to wrap our minds around uh, the, the sheer quantity of data that we're dealing with here, when you take our total measurements, so our total number of measurements was, remember, just over 4,000 measurements. So you multiply that by, you know, roughly 20 individual data points that the Photosync device can collect, and you're left with, you know, just over 80,000 data points. So we're dealing with a massive amount of data, and so uh, for us, the first thing we wanted to do is just try to break this down into something a little simpler that we are... Uh, we can more easily uh, figure out what's related to what and, and how can we tease apart um, uh, different correlations. So uh, The first thing I'll point out is that test weight, uh, which is essentially the size of the grain, um, was highly correlated to yield. That's expected, um, but I just thought I'd point that out. We also measured leaf area index, which is loosely uh, maybe an above ground biomass estimate um, and that was positively correlated with yield but not great. Uh, that's not too surprising because since um, the advent of plant breeding we have been selecting for uh, harvest index rather than just straight biomass. So biomass and yield should be perfectly correlated until you start selecting for just harvestable index. I'll also point out this block in the middle. This is the SPAD block. So we have you know, the device actually outputs a few different SPAD measurements that are highly correlated to each other. And uh, really the, the two that I'll focus on for a lot of this talk are Phi 2 and Phi NPQ. So that's uh, Photosystem 2, efficiency and um, energy dissipated uh, really by heat uh, or rather by non-photochemical uh, quenching. So you can see here that um, Phi 2 and Phi NPQ, uh, Phi 2 is positively correlated with yield at uh, 0.22 or 0.23, um, whereas Phi NPQ was uh, negatively correlated to yield with a correlation of 0.25. Um, so this is uncorrected data, this is raw off the device. We've simply eliminated a few bad data points um, that I already discussed and just ran the Pearson's correlation. So what does that correlation actually look like when we plot it out? So the Pearson correlation of Phi 2 compared to yield, you can see there's a positive relationship and Phi and PQ um, to yield has a negative relationship. I'd say that this is expected because, you know, theoretically, if a plant is has higher phi two, you would expect um, 
you know, that, that would, you would interpret that as higher photosynthetic efficiency of that plant, and if the plant is happier and photosynthesizing more, um, it's logical that it would also be producing more grain. Um, similarly, with the fine PQ, this is uh, energy that the plant could have used um, to increase biomass and, and, and grain yield, but instead it's dissipated that energy through non-photochemical quenching. So that's unused energy not going to uh, yield. So as the level of non-photochemical quenching increases, um, the yield would theoretically also decrease. So what I really, what I really wanted to do at this point is to try to figure out a way that we could visualize, you know, both the relationship between phi two, phi and pq, and yield. And there's really a simple way to do it. You simply plot phi two by phi and pq, and you can then overlay this plot with your yield data. And as you can see, um, as the yield increases, generally you get a steeper slope. So just to orient you, the purple and the yellow lines represent uh, plots that yielded between 95 and 120 bushels per acre. And the slope is steeper meaning that those plants, generally speaking, have, higher, have a higher ratio of phi 2 compared to phi NPQ. So less energy is being dissipated by non-photochemical quenching, and more energy is being absorbed and used uh, for photosynthesis, carbon assimilation, and theoretically yield. So Dr. Kramer, uh, already mentioned this relationship briefly in his talk, and uh, I think a collaboration between our group and, and his will hopefully be able to tease apart this relationship more. And, um, but at least uh, at, at this point, um, we've you know, targeted this relationship, um, whether it be the slope of the line or the ratio of phi 2 versus phi and pq, as a possible selection target. But I will mention at this point, as a, as a plant breeder, I feel compelled to say that you know, this is really a problem of correlated characters, which can in some cases be an advantage to the plant breeder, but in other cases uh, it can really be a problem because as we're selecting for, you know, say, this ratio that I just described, maybe we're shifting the balance in some other way and in, in a way that could be damaging to the plant. Um, for instance, the plant uh, would be less likely to protect itself under extremely high um, radiation levels, and that could be damaging and to the plant, which would actually result in yield decline. But at this point, I think there's good evidence that we could maybe make selections and, and see yield gains from that. But I just wanted to mention that. I got a question. Yes. Show my ignorance in statistics. If you go back to your first plot where you were showing the Pearson correlations. Uh, the, the what? The, keep going. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, um, what would an ideal plot like that be? Because that just looks like noise to me. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, obviously these correlations are extraordinarily low. Um, but what I'm getting to is like how we could maybe tighten those correlations. Um, what I was really illustrating here is that there is a lot of variance in the data but that the general trend is positive and negative. Okay. Did you bet your green program on it? No, <laughs> okay. absolutely not. And which, which is, uh, you know, provides more credence to finding a, a, yep. a more refined relationship. Between I just wanted to be sure yep. I wasn't being stupid. Yep. No, of course not. <laughs> so. So exactly, that's a great transition into what I want to discuss next. So one thing we're, we're well aware of is that phi, phi 2 and phi NPQ are extremely uh, closely related to uh, PAR. So PAR is a photosynthetically active radiation. And uh, you know we obviously know that there's a relationship between uh, radiation and photosynthetic levels. So what is that? 
and could we use that to our advantage, I guess is the question I'm asking. So as the proton flux density increases, um, you reach a point for the plant where it cannot absorb the excess light. It simply doesn't have, you know, the capability to absorb any more photons. And so it has to do something with those photons other than photosynthesize. And uh, one of those routes, again, is the non photochemical quenching. Um, but under optimal conditions, we hope that these plants could be well adapted and uh, happy, per se, and they'd use you know, more of those photons for photosynthesis. So I was curious as to what this relationship looked like in our own data. So as the amount of photons increases or the light intensity increases, um, you would expect the, the rate of photosynthesis to also increase. And um, this plot actually illustrates um, that very thing. So now, instead, we have the photosynthetic values across the x-axis and the phi 2 values across the y. And you can see that under lower light conditions, the plants are more um, uh, photosynthetically efficient because they're having they, they don't have to invest additional energy and resources into dissipating the those photons uh, through non photochemical quenching. And what I suggest to reduce the amount of variance that we saw is maybe we could fit um, in this case this is a logarithmic uh, tread line to the data um, that describes the relationship of phi two to phi uh, to uh, the radiation level, and we could create, a, we could uh, empirically determine the curve for each genotype, and we could feasibly, uh, feasibly correct for um, this relationship between um, phi two and uh, photosynthetic active radiation. Um, I haven't done that yet, but it's something that I'm really interested in, and I think could be used to reduce the variance that you saw in those first piercing correlations, which we really can't select on. <laughs> now, would that be related somehow to degree days? Yeah, absolutely. So, you're like, this is perfect. You're, you're leading me right where I need to go. So, if you have a curve like this for, for each of your genotypes, feasibly, what you could do, we have the weather data that's associated with each of our yield trial locations, and the weather station collects um, light incidents. And so what we could actually do is based on these curves, we could predict the photosynthetic efficiency of a given genotype across the entire growing season of the plant at every you know, 10 minute interval throughout the entire growing season. And we could estimate you know, the total photosynthetic ability of a given genotype compared to and, and, that's, and that's something that I, I think we should also look into. So, um, just to, this is the last time I'll have you look at this uh, <laughs> correlation table, um, but I just wanted to also point out that there's other photosynthetic parameters that are also related to yield. We identified FO prime and FS as being even slightly more correlated to yield than phi 2 and phi NPQ. And what I'll point out here is that FO prime and FS are not as affected by uh, light intensity as photosystem two or phi two and phi NPQ. There are other things that we would have to adjust for, for instance, maybe temperature when analyzing FO prime and FS data. But um, this is another avenue um, that we could try to improve our predictions of yield using not just phi 2, phi NPQ, phi NO, but combining them all into an aggregate model uh, and train it to uh, better predict yield um, across these genotypes. So what else could be affecting uh, the photosynthetic efficiency? Um, so far, you know, with land corrected data, we haven't found any significant differences 
um, when comparing conventional versus high management uh, production systems. But I suspect that'll change if we can better uh, adjust for the variance in the, in, in the data. But we did detect significant differences across location comparing the high management trial at Mason to the high management trial at Richville. And as you can see, the fine PQ was um, lower in Richville, the higher yielding environment, and higher, and it had higher Phi 2 in the high yielding environment. So this would also reinforce um, our observation that uh, Phi 2 and Phi and PQ could be related to yield. So, you know, in conclusion, I just want to bring it full circle and say that, well, the, the, the remaining question is, is there are there genetics that are really driving um, these differences in photosynthetic efficiency? And I would say, you know, based on the ANOVA analysis of um, these four selected photosynthetic uh, parameters, um, three of them are significant um, with unadjusted data. And uh, unfortunately, the Phi 2 was not. But I think, again, if we could correct for these values and reduce the variance, um, there would be clear differences there. I would say that there is uh, genetic um, differences in these genotypes that is driving that, and that's uh, potential for us to make genetic gains um, even in these highly adapted wheat varieties. So with that, uh, I'll take questions or we can move to the next speaker. So. If you don't mind, can we save some questions for yes, later and yeah, just yeah, keep the speakers moving on? That would be great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Cool. All right, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Karen Stahl Hebert. Did I get that right? Yeah. Excellent. All right, is a postdoctoral researcher at Kellogg Biological Station. She is working on switchgrass. Thanks. So I, like you mentioned, I work at the Kellogg Biological Station on switchgrass. And somewhat differently, I think, than like, I sort of fit in this session, um, I'm a plant ecologist. So I'm really interested in physiology and the response of plants to management and stress. But um, because I'm working on this really large collaborative research project that's focused on bioenergy and biofuels, kind of the intersections between individual plant responses and yield and their response to different stress and management um, is something that my project is focused on. And so I've been working with Catherine Gross, who's the director of the station down there, and Sarah Emery, who's at the University of Louisville. And last summer we had a really large group of research experience for undergraduate students, um, some undergraduate research apprentices from Michigan State, and a student from Kalamazoo College, lots of undergrads doing research projects. And I was really interested in measuring stress of plants, and I didn't have a way to do that planned out. So my intersection with the photosync group came at a really opportune time for this project. Like, we need to be able to determine differences between these different groups of plants that we have growing out we need to determine how they're responding to stress. And so I got an email from, you know, MSU News L or something, you know, just a news listener saying, hey, we have these photosync units and you should try them. Uh, so at the Kellogg Biological Station, just to give you a little background, we have these really large field experiments and planting trials looking at different uh, bioenergy feedstock cropping systems. And these range from conventional corn to corn soybean rotation to uh, perennial crops like switchgrass. Um, and so my research focus has been on these switchgrass uh, varieties and genotypes that they have growing in the experiments that they have planted here. And I'm going to talk really briefly about two different projects that I used photosync in. Um, and so our first research question were understanding how switchgrass varieties differed in traits. So I was really interested in looking at lots and lots of different traits for above ground and below ground characteristics of uh, panicum, which is the switchgrass uh, panicum verbatim that um, they're growing there. And a few years ago, right around the time that this project got started, I think seven years ago, 
uh, extension agent, uh, Dennis Pennington, planted 12 different varieties in a trial there to see which ones were going to be best suited. And so I had yield data over the past six years for these switchgrass varieties. I wanted to collect a lot of trait information and try to create relationships between their traits and their yield. And uh, in particular, I wanted to look at um, photosynthetic performance because these varieties might respond to stress really differently. Um, and then in the second project, I wanted to look at how switchgrass plants are affected by their relationships with mycorrhizae and how that might change under drought stress. And how, and also in sort of sub-questions in that project, how we might understand how fertilizer application might change those relationships between plants and their fungal mutualists and variety differences. So if we had different varieties that were being exposed to the same environments, how would that change? Um, and in this project, we actually constructed artificial uh, precipitation removal shelters over the fields. So we removed about 75% of precipitation all through the growing season. And I wanted to know, I could measure soil moisture really easily, but I wanted to know if we could measure any response in the plants to that level of stress. And if that differed between varieties. So photosync was awesome, and it allowed us to measure these different things that people have talked about. And it was really great to use with my students because even if they didn't have incredibly detailed knowledge of the chlorophyll fluorescence and how that was working, the system was really easy for them to use in the field. Um, Dan came down and did a training session with us, and pretty much we were up and running after that. You know, we were able to collect the data, the students were able to upload it really easily from their phones or phones that I bought uh, without a plan. And we were really interested in uh, this photo system 2 quantum efficiency. Uh, non-photochemical quenching, which we already learned a lot about. But also, we, I was really interested in this thing called maximum photosystem 2 quantum efficiency, which is uh, FVFM, and that is a dark, on a dark adapted leaf. So you measure the maximum total possible um, number of electrons that that leaf can uh, dissipate you know, using photosynthesis, and so you have to measure that in the dark. So. Some photosystem, like the ones that you pay lots of money for, have clips that you can do that uh, during the daytime, but we just did it in the middle of the night. So that was another nice thing about these units, is they were really easy to use in the middle of the night. And FBFM is a really great way of looking at uh, stress, because if a plant gets damaged during the day because there's so much light and it's not able to um, use all of that energy, that damage can accumulate. And most plants are able to repair that overnight and they rebuild all the proteins and machinery that they need. But if they can't, because let's say they're really drought stressed, you'll start to see lower uh, FBFM at night. So we measured that, and students thought it was really fun. So first thing, like we already talked about, to answer this question of how these switchgrass varieties, I had 12, varied in photosynthetic performance, there were really challenges for just taking the values that I measured for those 12 varieties and saying, what are the average differences? because of all the correlations with light availability. So um, this is my data here, and I have light intensity on the x-axis measured by the unit, and the um, P2 photosystem efficiency on the y-axis. And this is a really, really strong correlation. Um, so by building a linear model where I include PAR in it, and I also include the interaction between PAR and all of the varieties, so each variety is allowed to have a different slope, in the model, I can then remove all the variation that's associated with PAR from my data. And this is really important because I just wanted to compare a value across all the varieties. And because some of them are taller and shorter than the other, like for instance, we had one variety that was like this tall, and it could be growing in a 15 foot wide strip next to one that was this tall. So the actual like values of PAR that I was measuring, like they could all be lower in one variety, causing it to have a really different um, photosynthetic performance. So what I did is I just picked a standard PAR value on this model, and I extracted the value predicted for each variety at that standard value, and constructed error associated with that. And so this is what I get. Here are 12 varieties of switchgrass. They are all commercially available uh, varieties that people have used in this region. Three of them are experimental, like more proprietary varieties. And this is showing uh, phi 2 so the photosystem 2 efficiency. 
And there's some really, really large differences here. Not only in the median value, this black bars, but also in the variance. So this has been really interesting and useful in my larger analysis, where I'm combining this with 16 other traits that I've measured of these varieties, and then creating new combinations of all of these traits that are highly predictive of biomass. So up to 60 to 70% of the variation in biomass yield can be described by these 12 traits together. So it was a really useful way of looking at these. And we can see, so sow flow here, this has the highest photosystem two efficiency. And this is the genotype that's adapted to southwestern um, Michigan. It's the population that was collected from wild populations all around here and has had very minimal selection. Something like um, these three experimental varieties here have been selected for biomass performance. A lot in this trailblazer here with really low photosystem two efficiency is a variety that was selected for forage and digestibility. So somewhat interesting. So then we want to look at drought. And so we have these shelters here, are the shelters over the switchgrass plots. And here I'm showing this maximum quantum efficiency. So the theoretical level at which you expect to see most plants be no higher than 0.8, it's about the top level that you would expect for this parameter. And so anything that's significantly lower than that represents some form of damage to these plants. And these are control, and these are the ones that were under the shelter. We didn't really see a whole lot of difference, just um, overall, except I think maybe in one of the varieties. We have two different varieties with fertilizer and without fertilizer. Possibly one variety with fertilizer, there was some difference. But it's in the opposite direction of what we would have expected. So the plants that were uh, had less rainfall were actually doing better. So interesting. I haven't fully analyzed this data yet. Uh, and there are lots of other things that we're looking at. But So the shelter plots, these are ones that had less rainfall. So the soil moisture was significantly lower. It varied over the course of the season. So when we had those huge storms, they, it was all the same. But there were periods of time where the soil was significantly drier under the shelters. But the plants, in some cases, actually had higher quantum efficiency in that situation. Not what we would have hypothesized. But switchgrass is very drought adapted. So. <clears throat> You would expect also the fertilized plants in some instances to do worse on the drought conditions. Yeah, yeah. Well, our other hypothesis is that the fertilizer is going to disrupt some of the mutualisms that they have below ground, yeah. and so that they would perform worse under the drought. But we didn't really see that either. We're repeating it again this summer, so we'll see. Maybe the weather will be more conducive. Under the, these shelters, do they experience the exact same light? Because I mean, you would see, if you overall have less light stress, right, then you would expect that your FB over FM is, is a little higher. Yes. And that could, what you see there is, could be just attributed to the Attributed to the, these light differences. So, yes, the plastic um, sheeting on the top does affect light availability. We try to minimize that as much as possible with through the choice of plastic. Um, mm -hmm. I was using in this project some shelters that had been used by a grad student previously, and they were reported about 10% reduction in light availability. When I measured it, I was getting 20 to 30% reductions in light, which was only on the sunniest day. So, but that also is like, well, that's the new point that they're the most stressed, is the sunniest day. And they are getting less light. But if we looked at phi2, for instance, which is the measurement that you're taking in on illuminated leaves, we still didn't see any real strong signal of either that once you correct for the light availability or even if you don't. Um, our treatment wasn't quite as strong as we thought it would be, unfortunately. But we were really happy with using the photos. Can you go through the reason why you thought increased, nitrogen, increased fertilizer would decrease yield? Because that's counterintuitive. Not necessarily that it would decrease the yield. So at Kellogg Biological Station, they've had a lot of different trials with panicum and fertilizer, and the yield curves have been almost flat in every case. So there's been very little response to increasing fertilizer in these plants. And one of the hypotheses is that the fungal mutualists in the roots 
um, switchgrass is an obligate um, mycorrhizal plant, so it has to have these partners. And they are actually really efficient at getting nitrogen and phosphorus. And so one of our ideas is that the community of those organisms changes with fertilizer, and it also changes with drought. And there are also ideas that drought, some mycorrhizae are really protective against drought, and if fertilizer somehow removed those individuals from the soil community, you might get some negative effects of fertilizer when you're in a drought condition. But we didn't really see that uh, in our data. Uh, our yield data was also not particularly conclusive, like everything was pretty much the same. There was a lot of variation between the plots, which happens in ecology. <laughs> so um, the PhotoSync was great, really easy to use with our undergrads. Uh, the data archiving was easy, despite bugs and problems, I felt like it was no more than any of us were used to handling in our normal day-to-day -day life. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do these measurements otherwise because the units are too expensive. There were a lot of adverse field conditions going on with these units, uh, including middle of the dark night darkness, in which you actually can't use any light because you'll interrupt the measurements. The units were very good in these conditions, although the white color will be excellent, so the black, please. Um, yeah, and so some things that, you know, thinking about future uses of the photosync could be like leaf clips for dark adaptation or better ways to ID bad measurements. We already talked about these. So, thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, again, let's try to save questions. Um, running out of time, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk. Uh, and our, our last speaker is Joseph Coombs, who's a member of the MSU Potato Breeding and Genetics Program here on campus. So Dave Douches is the is the potato breeder here. Um, I've been a research assistant with him for a while, and I've been with him before that. And so in the breeding program, basically, you know, one of our main tasks is variety development, right? So we're having improved varieties, but we also do a lot of other things in the lab and trying to look at understanding the genetics of potato. And that's kind of where the intersection with the, the photosync project came in. And so. Um, you know, there are starting to be, you know, some um, kind of, you know, rumblings on campus about photosync. Here's a tool, a way to analyze some different, you know, photosynthetic parameters. And we thought, well, hey, we've got this kind of interesting genetic study out in the field. This would be kind of a nice test subject for us in the breeding program as a way to kind of look at that. And so, um, even if you guys aren't all potato geneticists, you can tell these don't really look like a lot of potatoes probably that, that you've seen. Um, so uh, cultivated potato is a tetraploid. It has four copies of all of its chromosomes. And this particular population that we're working with is actually a diploid population to kind of simplify the genetics of what's going on. And even beyond that, it's a, even more unusual. One of the parents of this population is a monoploid potato, which really doesn't exist anywhere except for in these couple clones. So that was actually the potato that was used for the potato genome sequencing project because it was a uh, double monoploid. So that's the one we're calling DM. Anyway, this particular population, we started with over a thousand individuals. It was actually uh, developed by one of our colleagues at Virginia Tech and so screened over a thousand individuals and basically what we're looking for is trying to pick out um, based on some greenhouse parameters, kind of the, the, the 10 best and the 10 worst. So the really highest and lowest vigor of this, of this population. We narrowed it down to about 100. Um, they were doing that in the, in the greenhouse, greenhouse growth chamber. We took 100 of those plants to the field. We had one year of replicated data from that, narrowed it down to the top 10 and the bottom 10. So we had this nice trial that we had this replicated, um, the replicated set of plots and we had this really, in theory, very different set of genetic material. And we were phenotyping this for, um, we're, we're, you're, we're using the, the field phenotype data to try to see if we can find correlations to 
um, different uh, potato gene sequence and copy number variation, uh, working with Robin Buell's group and also with the group in Wisconsin as part of this NSF project. And so um, we were evaluating a number of things. We thought, well, this would be great, right, because we're going to have vigor, plant height, yield, tuber weight, number of tubers, some other characteristics, and let's see what we can learn from using this photosync tool to see kind of what things um, we might be able to find correlations with. And so, you know, like everyone else here that's been working with the Photosync, it really, you know, it isn't going to happen without the collaboration with the Kramer Lab and the people there. And so for us being able to interact with the mobile phenotyping group was really critical in kind of getting the number and the data, you know, to, to start to actually try to see if there's something going on. Um, you guys have seen kind of the parameters everybody is really focusing on, 5.2 um, and the MPQ and the SPAD. Um, this is uh, some of the details about the experimental design. We probably really don't need to go into a lot of it unless people want to talk about um, the details. But um, in terms of sampling for the photosync, we were looking at um, three different leaf heights on the plant. So we did a, a top, a middle, and a lower leaf. And then we took these at three different dates. So um, basically at 10 day intervals from like 40 to 65 days after flowering. Essentially at a mid-season growth for these particular potato plants that were in the field. And this is just uh, the, the field shot. I think it shows a nice interaction. We've got, you know, people from our potato breeding team out there with the mobile phenotyping um, group. And these are the different plots. So we've got eight different potato plants in each one of these plots and you guys can See, hopefully, there's nice variation there for plant vigor, at least above ground, uh, for seeing, you know, some of these plots were really um, nice and vigorous, and some of them were, you know, trying not to be potatoes anymore. And so, you can see we have a lot of, well, a lot of variation that we can see from other phenotyping parameters, and so um, we're looking to see if that's going to correlate with what we're seeing with the photosynth data. So, um, just like Everybody else, you get a lot of data, you try to filter that down to quality data that you can start to work with. Um, you guys know it's, it's a lot of data and there is a lot of variation, right? And that's, I think, some of the benefits, but the challenge is also in kind of working with this. Um, I'm really, I, I think, I don't know, gloves are kind of trendy, but there are a lot of people using them in plant genetic systems and so, I know uh, in basically working with Greg, he's kind of moving towards blups as a way to kind of, you know, look at the photosync parameters. So everything here that we've looked at, I've looked at as a blup for both the photosync parameters and for the, on the plant side. When you have a lot of, um, you know, different number of observations for the different plots at different times. Um, originally when we put it in, you know, it's all, I think everyone's in a very similar situation, I feel like, anyway. I mean, I really even had had enough time to go and explore this data and ways to analyze it, right? So how do you look at it? We took kind of an initial look and you kind of, you know, separate things out or you throw everything in and try to see if you get some correlations. Um, I felt that the different height, whether it was the top, the middle, or the bottom leaf, actually was pretty significant in the differences that we were seeing in terms of uh, peeling out whether to use one or the other. Also, you know, there are differences between the three different times. They were taken at 10-day intervals, but I didn't feel like the differences between that time window was, was that different. So, I mean, that's still another thing you can go back and look at if you want to tease out these things over time, you know, or are you looking, for us anyway, are there any gross differences that we can kind of see? And so this is a little bit, um, you know, just like looking at a big correlation chart. I mean, there's a lot of data. How do you kind of look at it? How do you visualize it? I thought this was kind of an interesting way to kind of see, you know, we've got, so we have the three different leaf positions here, top, middle, and bottom. And then uh, four different um, photosynthetic parameters that we were kind of keying on. So the SPAD, the MBQ, the NO, and the PHI-2. And then these were some of our um, phenotype parameters. So we've got yield, vigor, the number of tubers per plot, specific gravity, which is kind of the density or the, of the potato, and then plant height and average tuber weight. And so 
there's a lot of variation for what is significant or not. The, the larger the bubble, the more significant, right? And so going in to tease out how you want to look at the data and how you're going to interpret that data is still kind of where we are with this. And sometimes you're going to find correlations that look like, well, that's interesting and meaningful, but then you don't see them with these other parameters. Um, I'm interested in seeing, you know, the combined analysis that Dave Kramer had this this morning. That I mean, anybody that can get a correlation between yield and you know photosynthetic parameters like that, that's what you need to know, right? <laughs> so that that was pretty nice. Um, I'm just going to show a couple examples here. Um, this is looking at SPAD. And just these were some of the most significant that we had. Um, this is actually looking at the top leaf position across all the three different dates. And basically, we, we had a nice correlation between vigor and SPAD and plant height and SPAD. And these things, you know, I think that makes sense. But it's nice to see that, you know, you're able to have some meaningful information from the photosynthetic data that correlates to kind of what you're seeing biologically. So. We're still kind of, you know, there's never enough time to work on all the data and all the different projects that you have. Um, I think this is just uh, kind of an example of, you know, here are the different clones that we had that we were looking at. And we kind of had them categorized as whether they were high and low. I don't know the best way to, to point out oh, what's out there. So, um, basically, it's got an H or an L, that's what had been kind of pre-classified as being a high or low vigor. And so when uh, we look at this, we actually had a tetraploid clone in there, Atlantic is kind of a high vigor check. This is one of the parents, and then this is the other parent, so this would be the high vigor parent. That would be the low vigor parent. And you can see, in general, we're starting to see, you know, the, the highs are grouping at or above the high vigor parent, and that's okay. If, you know, you see some transgressive segregants that kind of can happen. Um, again, here you're seeing some higher, and then this is just kind of uh, to throw in some biological data when we're looking at yield. And we can see even even when you're looking at yield per plant, you know, our top three clones were ones that we had previously identified as being in that low vigor category, right? So even how they're categorized doesn't translate exactly to what biological data you end up having, but um, the, you know, like all these projects, you need a bunch of people. We appreciate the collaboration with the, the PhotoSync team. So, I mean, that's really what's kind of made it happen. So, I don't know. I think we're kind of, all of us, in a very similar position where, well, we've kind of played around with it. We have some data. We're starting to see some things. How do we better analyze and use this data to make some, you know, more, you know, informed choices about how it's going to fit with what we're doing with the research. So. That's where we are. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, actually it looks like we're out of time. I was hoping to have a little bit more time for, for discussion, so I need to go to another session, but that doesn't mean y'all can't spend a few minutes having a conversation. Um, but I, I want to thank all the speakers. You did a great job, and I'm really, uh, I was really excited to see all your results. It's the first time I had seen it. And just from Photosync perspective, it definitely helps me to see, and Sebastian's probably in the same boat, that how we help people deal with the data afterwards. We've been very good at giving you the ability to get the data. One of the next steps we need to work on is helping to build these modules once you have it, what to do with it, because you're right, it's a ton of data. It's not all immediately clear what it means. We need to help figure out ways to pull it out. All right, so thank you three. Again, 